Happy Wednesday, everybody. We're very grateful you can join us here tonight for uh, session number two with the State 48 Foundation. Yeah, yeah, a little excitement. We're going to get more excited as the night goes on. But uh, because of tonight's uh, special title, we're going to start with a disclaimer because we're going to hear some things tonight that uh, will be legal advice but not legal advice. And if you've ever hired a lawyer, you know what that means. So uh, before we get started, we'll give you a disclaimer. That's what it says. That nothing these attorneys do or say should be construed as personalized financial or legal advice. This event does not create an attorney-client relationship with any attendee. If you need personalized advice, you should hire the appropriate professional. Thank you. That's just, and that was pro bono too, so we're good on that, right? Well, my name is Zach. I'm the president of the State 48 Foundation. This is year two of our incredible speaker series. Uh, we're very grateful that the pandemic has subsided a little bit for us to, to come back and be in person. And last year we did this virtually. Um, we were just blown away by the leaders, the, the ideas, the business creations that were taking place in this community and across the state. But then again, to double down again this year to Walter Studios, opening up this incredible space for us. Um, one time for Walter Studios, if we can give them a big round of applause. So as we kick off series two this year, um, you know, some incredible partners have stepped up and we wanna start with uh, our friends over at OG's for coming in and being our, our title sponsor. It's incredible, we have this crazy idea and we give a call to OG's and say, hey, are you guys down? And they said, We're dope. let's be in. What else do you need? What else do you need? And that's what's incredible about this community we're building. And so, so OGs, thank you for believing in us and, and sponsoring us here this evening. It's incredible. You know, we've also got some really great friends over at Every Impression Counts. Um, really cool story. Uh, I was founded by a guy I went to college with at Phoenix College, um, class of like 07 or 06. And when you meet somebody that long ago and you see that their path took them to working for somebody else, working at a place, working somewhere else again, and then saying, you know what, I'm just gonna go out and do it on my own. Um, it was really special to see that journey come full circle. And if anybody here can relate, you know, if you work for somebody else and say, you know what, I'm gonna go do it for myself, that's a huge jump. And when you take that jump, you look at your friend group and, and you do that. So I'm really proud of Dustin, all the guys, at every impression counts. Thank you guys so much again for believing in everything we're doing at State 48 and at the foundation as well. I know we talk about Walter Studios. You wanna come up with an idea I, you should look at their story from, you know, everything they're doing in this space. They're growing just incredible. Look at that. I mean, some, this was somebody's idea and they're like, all right, cool. Let's roll with it. Like that's what's cool about being an entrepreneur. And I'm sure um, there was some, some legal steps that had to be taken to hang all this stuff in here as well. So maybe we should talk to their lawyers. This is all pretty cool stuff. You know, so as we get going, this is a four part series. Was anybody here with us last week? Wow, okay, okay. You know, so this is number two, and as you know, we're giving away $25,000 total in grant money, increments of 1000 and 5000 and so on. So for being here already at session two tonight, you're already a step closer to qualifying for one of these grants. You know, there's a survey that's gone out. We ask you please fill out that survey after each session. We've got two more sessions coming up as well. Marketing and branding taking place right here again next week, and system and processes on Wednesday, August 24th will be our final session. So here today to learn about entrepreneurship, you know, some legal, some financial advice. But let me tell you about State 48 Foundation and everything that we're doing and why we're doing things like this. So, um, you know, we're born from the apparel company State 48. Raise your hand if you have a State 48 t-shirt. Okay, we're not going to say don't raise your hand if you don't have one, but I did see some hands not go up, so we're going to work on that today. Some really cool State 48 t-shirts for sale outside. You should check those out. We even got a really cool one that was designed this year um, about making sense and copper here in Arizona, which is really cool. Um, but we're an entrepreneurship-born organization. Um, you know, the three founders started, they went to Chandler High. Um, you know, they put together their small 500 bucks each, and they said, hey, I got this crazy idea in a garage. Um, it's almost like a punk rock band. Everything starts in a garage, right? And so here they are starting State 48. Um, I'm still trying to get them to bring back the vintage t-shirt that start. I don't know how many, that's a, probably illegal. When does something become vintage? But I think we're ready for the vintage State 48 line. Um, but it's an entrepreneurship born organization and they've had these different designs. And you think about it, it started with one and then two and then five in different colors. And then this whole B2B collaboration and storytelling, which then comes into copyrights and trademarks and colors. And there's just been an incredible tale of how the State 48 brand has evolved. But now they're working with global brands like Intel and Discount Tire and GoDaddy and so many more. But you gotta think about what that brand resonates around the world. When you see a PetSmart logo, that goes around the world, and here they are working in our community, and the different trademarks and the different things that go into trademark lawyers at PetSmart saying, hey, that's a really cool shirt, but you can't do that. It's crazy, but that's why lawyers are here, and it's just incredible that we can do this to save all of you the path that had gone through at the State 48 side. 
You know, locally owned businesses are truly the heartbeat of this community. You look at things going on in this community right now, and it's, it's great to have national brands and franchises out here, but uh, if you've seen the news lately, what's happening at Pizzeria Bianco? Uh, Pizzeria Bianco, Chef Bianco is a, a James Beard award-winning chef, one of the best chefs in America, in the world, and one of his chefs is sick right now and had a stroke. If we lose a Pizzeria Bianco or we lose a chef like that and that building shuts down, that's one more vacant building in our community. That's one more small business that's not thriving in this community. This business is, this community is built on small business brands like Pizzeria Bianco in downtown Phoenix of all places that went through the 90s and the 2000s and the first crash. That's why this community is so strong and gets stronger every session we have. If you're meeting uh, somebody else that's a business in this room, I have no idea what some of these businesses are. But you know what our community is better with? Businesses like yours, and you come into things like this to invest and protect yourselves so you can grow and foster that business in this community and beyond. So we talk about different resources. You know, Not only are we doing our grant money here, but we've got some incredible resources over here on the side. So as we work through our session and afterwards, I'd like to invite you to come over. We've got the Arizona Commerce Authority, which I learned a little bit more about. Uh, we've got our state's ombudsman here. It's just incredible. They're our state's economic development organization. You can learn a lot. They've got their own weekly webinar series. Um, it's all downloaded, too, so you can catch up over 100 sessions they've got online. We've got the Maricopa Small Business Development Center. They're offering small business resources. We've got to thank you guys for coming out tonight and being a part of it. And then we've got the uh, Arizona Microcredit Initiative. They're doing micro loans and free consulting as well. So we're talking about grant money. We're giving away money. We're fundraising all year round. We're doing some really cool stuff with the brand. Um, to do that, you've got to come to two of the four. You've got to complete one post-session survey, which will be emailed to you tonight or tomorrow. And then after you do those two things, at the end of the series on the 24th, you then will be selected to enter into our grant application process. Our board and our board friends will then be a part of that process where we'll announce um, that. We've even got some, uh, anybody in here tonight a grant winner from last year? Got any grant winners in here from last year? Okay. It's good because they're not trying to compete for your dollars. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying here? So that's a very cool part about this is that, you know, we're looking at some of our grant winners from last year, what they're doing in the community this year. Um, we're talking about putting on our annual event coming up in November. We're going to have one of our grant winners there who's got a mobile photo booth, and it was just really cool to invest in that. And now that the events are going off again, he's able to amplify his business and get back in the community. And it was really cool being a small piece of his story moving forward. So, you know, before I introduce our panel of speakers, um, there's going to be an opportunity for your questions at the end. We're going to do a 30-minute panel up here. Uh, I got some preset questions based off of some thoughts that we had, some thoughts that they had. Um, so stick around afterwards. We've got an incredible networking session going on as well. There are some networking cards at the door, some, some quick starter questions for you to ask other entrepreneurs here tonight as well. So let's get into um, the three things we're talking about tonight. We're going to be going through legal and financial professionals. We're going to talk about the important factors that all businesses need to consider the scope of legal and financial topics that are wide, and we're gonna cover some of those today at a higher level, back to the disclaimer early on. The high level thoughts here are what they're gonna provide some advice on. And that advice is up to you if you say, hey, that's impacting my business. They're even gonna offer some services afterwards for some consultations, which is uh, really cool. So don't forget about the resources on the side. You're gonna connect with everyone afterwards as well. So each one of our speakers uh, are gonna provide a resource seat that dives deeper into their area of expertise as well. So um, without further ado, enough about us and me, and let's get into uh, all the facts. So let's introduce our speakers. We've got uh, Hua Chen. She's a Padmark and trademark attorney at Booth Udall. We'd like to welcome her up. We got Ruth Carter, founder of Evil Geniuses at Geek Law Firm. We'd like to bring them up. And Michael Fussell, tax attorney at Tax Law Associates. We'd like to bring you up as well. So come on up here and join me on stage. Awesome. And we have Lucy, and I didn't invite Lucy. I don't know where she went to school, but Lucy's a good girl, and Lucy's going to join us up here as well. I had the pleasure of hanging out with Lucy before. Good belly scratches. Good girl. Look at Lucy. Let's go, Luce. Awesome. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we'll get started. It's all right. You guys can keep me on track there. All right. So, again, we talked about our disclaimer early on. Just, again, please remind yourselves, again, this is... Uh, Nothing they do uh, should be construed as personal financial legal advice. This is not an uh, attorney-client relationship with any attendee. And if you need personalized advice, you should hire the appropriate professional. So as we have our panel, everybody's mics up. Good to go. We're going to get started. And we'll start. Um, we'll go over there. We'll go left to right. We'll go with Hua. If you had to pick one, what would you say are the biggest legal or financial mistakes new business owners make? Or how would you recommend they avoid these mistakes? 
So I know that we have two attorneys with wider expertise who will give you the most important answer that I agree with, but I'm just going to give my answer from the point of view of intellectual property. So every business actually has an IP portfolio, and that at least encompasses whatever your branding is about. It's whatever that may be, that will be part of your IP portfolio. In order to develop that IP portfolio and to adequately protect it, you have to have an idea of how your branding plan will be, how your business development plan will become. And that is the most important thing, is actually having a concrete plan. Once you have that plan, you can go to the appropriate legal professional and get the advice that you need to meet your whatever goal it may be. Thank you. Michael? I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I'm not used to a microphone, so we'll have to get used to this. Um, I think you do need a business plan, just a basic business model of how you are going to attack the discipline that you want to do in your business. Once you've got your business model, and there are avenues out there to help you build a business model if you need that, and I believe in the resources that are provided to you, um, there are some of those uh, are, are um, in that uh, resource. SCORE is one of them. If you need a business model, that's a free service, and they will provide you a business plan. That's where you want to start. The next step would be to determine what type of entity would be best for you, and I would advise you to get some professional help in making um, your entity structure decision. So I think the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make is not having their legal ducks in a row before they open their doors. They're so excited about doing the business, they forget to take care of the legal back end, and they don't realize that they've not done something until they're dealing with a big problem. Uh, the two biggest ones I see are own, if you have a business that has multiple owners, that they don't have a contract between them about how they're going to run their business. And the other one is companies that are providing services don't have a good contract template or sometimes no contract um, for using with their customers. Thank you. Anybody here in, in real estate? Yeah. Anybody here in real estate own a property with a partner? Okay. Do you and your partner have an operating agreement? Is that something that maybe you start off and said, hey, Mike, you know, I, we should buy Airbnb. Like, you're my boy. We're going to get this Airbnb, me and you, 50-50. Cool, right? That's probably something that's happening in this marketplace now. Prices are high. Rates are high. But I'm like, Mike, let's get rich together. We're going to buy this Airbnb, and we're going we're gonna to crush it. But then one day, oh, you said you're not in? Without operating agreement. Wow. Crazy. So I'm saying the same thing. Michael and I had some time today, and our first question's over to you, but uh, my neighbor is a doctor, and during COVID, we're like, hey, we should do something fun together. We're like, yeah, sure, me and you will go have an av on Airbnb. It's been incredible. But I learned something today that I didn't know, that what happens if they want to sell half? I have no right of refusal. So they could sell it to their mom. They could sell it to another doctor. They could sell it to Mike. And I'm like, oh, no. But, oh, yeah. But all these things I don't think about going into that agreement. So it's, again, fascinating. Again, you think you're doing something right with a really good friend. And you're like, oh, this is cool. But you forget I'm guilty, too. So I'm really sorry. But <laughs> Michael, yeah, it's a, I'm in trouble down the More road. More business yeah. for me. Yes. <laughs> so you know, uh, before I, I get to Michael, Everyone in the room, I, I said a little bit, I'm Zach, I, I'm part of State 48 Foundation, and I guess I kind of ran over a little bit of, of you know, who we are and a little bit about your bio. So let's just back up a little bit, and uh, we'll start on the end with Ruth. Just tell us about yourself and, and what got you into the State 48 Foundation speaker series here tonight. Okay. Uh, Ruth Carter, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm the owner of Geek Law Firm. I am also of counsel to another firm called Venturis. Um, I have a practice that focuses on business, intellectual property, and internet law. And I opened my business right out of law school. So I had to put my ducks in a row. I had to do everything for myself that I now do for my clients. There you go. Okay. So I'm Michael Fusell. I own Tax Law Associates. Um, I am a CPA. Um, I'm also an attorney, and I have a Master's of Laws in Taxation. That's a post juris doctorate degree. Um, we work yeah. with closely held businesses in order to help them structure tax savings opportunity, and most of that work is done to start out with at an entity structural level. And so if you're a new business person, 
getting assistance with what type of entity you should be is a big deal, and that will set the foundation for how your taxes will be um, drafted in the initial years. As you move forward in the development of your business, you need to readdress your entity structural analysis because different entities have different tax rules, and as you develop and grow, it may be in your best interest to blend those items together to effectuate the best outcome for you over the long run. Awesome. Hello, I'm Hua Chen, and I actually have a very strong science background. I spent a lot of time in a research lab at University Medical School in Tucson, UMS, University, UMC. And, um, but I got interested in intellectual property, and that's all that's really important, relevant to you guys. You don't care that I have a master's in physiology. Uh, <laughs> And, um, but it's because of my interest in intellectual property that I ended up going into law school, and I'm very happy to say that I, I am an IP attorney. While most of my work is getting patents on biotechnology, my favorite clients are the ones that tell the best stories, and those are always the trademark clients. Mm. Well, it's funny, there's a, there's a lot of stories. I have to ask Mike about some trademark stuff, but if you get time with him on State 48, um, it's been fascinating to kind of watch the journey of, of this brand that we've all come to know and love. But if you're driving on the freeway and you see State 48 plumbing, uh, they're not a f unless you started a plumbing business recently, but there's a lot that can be said about uh, that as well within our own brand. And I think that's what we were discussing a lot beforehand as we kind of got to know each other. Um, is just he hearing some stories of how, where you came from, and, and Michael, we talked earlier today, or you know, Ruth, again, your story to becoming the law that you're so fixated on, and you're a change agent in this community. It's fascinating when you think about, what, 12 years of law school, or what's the, the number of years? You're 30? Whatever that number is, it's too much for it me. It feels like 12 at times. It's what we're, I mean, each of you said how many degrees you have, so when do you guys graduate, right? <laughs> you know, I'm just kidding. But it's just fascinating that, you know, as you guys become experts in your space, you know, you talked about science, and you talked about engineering, and you talked about, or what was it, engineering, or you got your master's in something else? So. Technology, I okay. have a management science degree, which I do not use. <laughs> it's just crazy, and I think that's the cool part about entrepreneurship is it kind of goes hand in hand. Is like you hear all of them saying, hey, I went one way, but it wasn't too late for me to go another. And I think that's what's really, really cool about this space. But also, uh, your time is valuable, so we'll just keep it moving so we don't get more billed hours here. Um, <laughs> all billable hours, right? No, I'm kidding. So let's jump right in, and, and Michael, I think uh, as a, a small business owner myself, I got excited about you know, where I'm at in my walk, talking about taxes and financials and all that. So we kind of want to get started with you, and you know, when most people venture into their own businesses, they think of registering as an LLC. Uh, do you have an LLC? You want to raise your hand? Can we get a, a little hand in here? LLCs. Okay. Awesome. There it goes. So walk us through a little bit entity types. You know, what type of company does one want to be an LLC or incorporated? And like we talked about S-Corps and C-Corps. LLCs, again, own this room, but walk us through where they might be as an LLC and what would be a C-Corp or an S-Corp or what you see best for them. Um, okay, so um, most of you are going to be um, told that an LLC is superior to an incorporated business because there are some added asset protection values with a limited liability company that an incorporated business doesn't get to enjoy. Um, there, it's somewhat limited. And so, so if you have a liability that runs to your business, which most of your liability will if you're operating a small business, it won't make any difference whether you're an incorporated business or a limited liability company. In the event that you had a personal liability, a limited liability company is superior to an incorporated business for a, a number of reasons that are beyond me getting into today. Um, now, if you, if you choose to be a limited liability company versus an incorporated business, it will default to different taxations depending on what you pick. So if you pick an incorporated business, it defaults to a C-corporation taxation. If you pick a limited liability company, depending on how many owners you have, it will, de it will default as a single member limited liability company. It'll default to what's called a disregarded entity, and that is taxed as a sole proprietorship. If you have a multi-partner limited liability company, that defaults to a partnership and for taxation. And so, so under the tax rules, a professional tax person can tax you in any way that you so desire, but they need to help you figure that out. If you don't have any assistance, then whatever you default to is what you're gonna be. And, and so now, one other thing that entrepreneurial guys need to know, your tax people that do your tax returns 
um, they are hesitant to give you much legal advice with regard to entity structure because that's a legal job. So if you think about when you had your limited liability company set up, you were probably instructed to go see your lawyer. Well, so, so the problem is, is that people don't revisit their lawyer as they develop over time. And so whatever you started out with is what you end up with. And I've got guys that are literally at retirement age. And I'm like, why are you structured this way? They can't even remember. And so, so it's up to you to address that as you develop, and, and having a multiple entities once the business grows typically makes a lot of sense. But you need to get assistance with that, otherwise you'll be in a default situation, and often your person doing your tax returns is hesitant to steer you in any other direction because that's not, to, that's not what they do. And so please keep that in mind. Yeah, and I, I thought it was special about, you know, again, talking about this in August, we're still in the 2021 tax year. And so a lot of the things I wanna bring out as we kind of go through this is there's still time to be mindful of that for your 2022 taxes and making sure you're taking advantage of the right write-offs or the right corporate structure. Uh, and that was some stuff that as we met earlier today, I was fascinated to learn is we still got time. It's not like it's, you're meeting with your tax professional and you're like, oh, well, here's what I did. Well, oh shoot, you missed it. So I encourage you all to kind of focus on that as we're here in Q3 heading into Q4, there's still time to think about your taxes. And one of the things that we talked about earlier today was how many entrepreneurs focus on the, you know, I got to cut my expenses to make my margins better. But if you focus on your taxation, there's equal benefits there uh, as well. Um, without, without question. And, and um, the, the problem is, is that, um, that you, you start out just like Ruth had said, and you get really excited about your operating aspects and your Couldn't operating be me. goals. Couldn't be me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this stuff just doesn't get readdressed. And so it's up, it's up to you as a business owner to manage the growth and, and opportunities that can be brought to you with regard to your entity structure. And, and the simplest way to think about it is different types of entities have different sets of tax rules, and it may be in your best interest to blend those as you develop over time. If you fail to do that, then you more than likely are overpaying your tax bill, and you would be shocked at how substantial that can be. So now we know about our taxes, but before we can file our taxes, we got to have some intellectual property, and we got to come up with this idea. So let's um, let's start with Wah. Can you uh, speak about primary or most relevant types of IP or intellectual property? So I think the types that everyone's familiar with would be trademarks and copyrights. You see the TM sign, you see the R with a circle, and you see the C with a circle. And that is probably relevant to all business owners. The less relevant, or at least people think are less relevant, are the patents. You hear about Google, Apple, Samsung, these headlining litigation, and you're like, I don't have a product like that. But there is a specific type of patent that's called a design patent, and it's in particular named design, not a utility, because it's meant to protect something that's ornamental. And that is something that can actually be very important to your branding strategy, especially if you have anything that is of ornamental value. It can be a logo, it can be an app logo, a web interface or customer interface on a website. It can also be a product design, and the most famous one historically is the Coca-Cola bottle. That is the biggest success story in the context of a design patent. They filed a design patent on the shape of their bottle, and that got them market monopoly in terms of how that bottle looks. Over the years, that bottle appearance earned what's called distinctiveness, and that's how Coca-Cola was then able to get trade dress, which is a form of trademark protection, and that protection has no time limit. As long as it is used in commerce, as long as they're still selling products using that bottle, it belongs to Coca-Cola and no one else can use it. So I think for most entrepreneurs, you want to study up on trademarks, copyrights, because if, especially if you design a logo, copyright is a form of protection, and design patents. It may actually be something for your logo or for your product. Mm -hmm. um, mm. That's probably for most of the audience. And then if it's a utility patent, that's a more complicated mm. question. <laughs> but that's where it's crazy. Again, you think about a Coke, you think about the Coke logo, not the Coke bottle. But when you say the Coke logo, you think of the Coke bottle. Crazy. Hey, Huat, can you, do you want to touch on uh, trade secrets too? Oh, yes. That's the other part. So trade secrets is a lesser known intellectual property. It's most primarily protected from a non-disclosure contract. And the reason is anything that has commercial value being a secret is protectable as a trade secret. And lately there has been new federal le um, legislation that makes it even easier and 
uh, I wouldn't say affordable, but more of value for people to invest in protecting their trade secrets. And so for a lot of people, you don't know this, but your client list, your contractor list, any contact list, basically your knowledge, your know-how within your field and industry, that is a trade secret and that is something that can be protected as a trade secret. So you might actually want to think about if you're hiring workers, including a non-disclosure element, because if they have access to your clientele list, if they have access to your contractor list, you want to make sure that even when they leave, they cannot take that information and steal your business that way. Mm. Never really thought of it that way. Depth here. Well, so Ruth, talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, when you're talking about going through the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, why should somebody start that process or even go through that trouble? Like, hey, I'm starting this business, this is what I'm gonna go to, but I gotta go to the Fed? So why would somebody go through that and, and walk me through that? Okay, so, you can file what's called a trade name at the state level. That gives you almost no protection. It's also very cheap, so it's not a bad thing to do. It just doesn't give you, you don't get a lot with it. There is a process to go through the USPTO to register a trademark, which means you can change the little TM to the R in the circle. And if somebody comes to me and says, should I register a trademark for my company name, my product name, our logo, our slogan, et cetera, um, I ask them, well, how much would it suck if you had to rebrand because somebody else registered that trademark first? Because when you have a registered trademark, you get a monopoly to use that trademark to sell your product or service everywhere in the US. Um, if you don't register it, the only protection you have is based on your geographic market, which if you're just starting out, is probably pretty small. And so if you're just starting out and you have your little bubble of business, let's say in the Phoenix metro area, and somebody else starts a business um, doing the same type of service or product you know, across the country and they register the trademark, think of it like a snow globe dropping over your geographic area. You, since you were using it first, you get to keep using it in that bubble, but you can't expand out. And so what, now that we have an internet-based society, it's really hard to not automatically expand just by having a website. So what ends up happening is companies end up having to rebrand, um, or worse, I've even seen people have their trademarks stolen out from underneath them because they didn't register them, um, and it sucks. And so I talk to my clients about you know, how much do you love your brand, do you wanna change it, and how much would it cost to change it because Oftentimes, it's more cost effective to maintain a trademark, you have to do periodic renewals, um, than do a full rebrand. Can you give us a good example, something that might be public knowledge of a rebrand that you're like, holy cow, that cost them X amount of dollars? Because I'm a lawyer, not a graphic designer, unfortunately, I can't give you a monetary um, Example, but I can tell you that the fee to register a trademark, just the, just the filing fee, not what your lawyer costs, um, is two hundred and fifty dollars. Is the mm. minimum filing fee. Huge. So that's not, you know, I, I'm having my website redone. I know what I'm paying. It's a lot less than registering a trademark. Mm. You know, it just again as we kind of walk through this, I think about national natural examples of where you can say the commonality of, of the Coke bottle or the commonality of the LLC, the somebody who's saying, oh, I'm changing the cup. Well, the cup's a good cup, but I, I gotta save my money, I gotta save my money, and we're looking at the bottom line, but I think the common theme here is when you're, when you're forgetting the basis of your risk and that your risk is your finances and your risk is legal, you're gonna get attacked. Uh, both of those are ways you can be attacked, so I think that's the most fascinating part of these conversations is everyone in this room is starting their own business or wants to start their own business, has this full heart and a lot of this energy and this passion and I'm gonna change this space. I'm gonna change the way this service is done and yet sometimes when you're leading with your heart you forget to, to think up top with the, the common sense stuff. So, And um, I often tell clients, before you fall in love with your name or your brand, run a search on the trademark database um, or hire a lawyer to do it, tmsearch.com. 
www.uspto.gov. Um, especially if you're just looking up a name. Um, you're not trademark experts, I don't expect you to be, but you can at least do a basic search to see has somebody else already registered this and so you don't fall in love with a brand that you can't have. I would actually recommend just starting from a Google search because you don't ever want to be that entity where yes, you found a mark that you really like, you found your name and you try to register it with the USPTO and then the USPTO examiner finds an internet listing somewhere of a company that's been using it for the last five years and they tell you, well, you don't have first use in commerce, so no, you can't register this mark. Uh, so before I go to the next question, that's made me think. So if I have a, a Twitter handle, are we talking intellectual property now? Like I, it's, I'm Zachary Hall and I have at Zachary Hall, but then if I wanted this brand, like at what point does it stop from being myself to like, hey, I'm, I have this whole brand because I'm on social media, do I have any property rights to that or that's all you give all that up as well? So let's start by prefacing this with the answer to e every legal question starts with, it depends. Mm. So, <laughs> because a lot of people will say like, if I have a registered trademark, can I get the domain? And not always, because a trademark is actually whatever you're claiming as your brand plus whatever you're selling with it. So um, it's possible for two companies that are in completely different industries to have the same name, like Delta Dental and Delta Airlines. Mm. So they both may have Delta as registered trademarks, but if I know Delta Airlines has Delta.com, um, <laughs> Delta Plumbing can be like, hey, you got to cough that up to us because we have a registered trademark. So it's we're getting into the gray area yeah. of the law, and this is when it's like, hey, this is when it's good to have the consult with the lawyer to, to talk about what IP you do or don't have or might be creating in the future. Mm. Well, no, it, Can yeah. I add one quick thing to yeah. that? So, so when you set, when you get your domain name, look for variations of your domain name and buy them all. Yes. <laughs> right out of the gate, and that way you don't have people piggybacking on you r right from the beginning. Or registering a porn site for the like .net <laughs> version of your company's name. I've seen that happen. And don't forget about hyphen dashes breaking things up because one of um, one of our clients had that issue their mm -hmm. domain name, and then someone else got it for a similar but not quite enough industry. And I just added a hyphen to it. Mm -hmm. So that was the hard problem to fix. Awesome. So <laughs> this is going to come back to the financial side, because when we're talking about you know LLCs and S-Corps, you, know, um, you said, Ruth, you mentioned the website for patent trademark, us.pto. Oh, I mean, it's uspto.gov if you want to look up a trade, if you want to do a trademark search specifically, tmsearch.uspto.gov. So then we are, did the simple Google search, which then can bring up social media. You can go up images. That's always good as well. But then back to Michael, let's, we talked about formation. You can also go to the Secretary of State to figure out if somebody's got an LLC in your name, and that's important too. Right. So you have to do a name reservation when you set up your entity, whatever that first entity is, and they will not let you um, set up a company that already is in existence that somebody else owns. That'll create confusion in the marketplace, according to the Secretary of State. So that's, that's, that step will be done for you initially, immediately. Mm. So again, as you're starting a business, already have a business, you've got now three tools, talking about intellectual property, looking up the patent trademark office, and again, Secretary of State. So Actually, in Arizona, it's, the, it's weird. Trade names go through the Secretary of State. Um, LLCs and corporations go through the Corporation. Arizona Corporation Commission. Mm. But again, good tools. So if you're on there already, great. If you're not, there's a great tools. They're free. You can log online. That's easy there. So, you know, Michael, we're talking about taxes. It's August. People that had filed um, <laughs> extensions, if you, yeah, that's coming up. But again, as we have a little bit of time left in 2022 taxation, talk to me a little bit about um, two to three mistakes you're seeing business owners making and how you can avoid making these mistakes. You know, you talked earlier a little bit about um, entity type, which I thought was a really cool thing, but those are, that's probably a little bit deeper, but two to three mistakes that I'm sure everyone here could probably relate to. Um, a, a lot of folks um, don't keep enough, good enough accounting records when you're just starting out, and you end up missing deductions because you forgot that you did that and never recorded it. And, and so if you're new and you're focused on selling business and getting business and doing a good job, um, if you don't keep accurate records is the first mistake that I think people make. 
Um, then once you've got your record keeping system down, then you need to make sure that you educate yourself on what's deductible in your industry. And, and there are standards and there's different uh, standards based on whatever business that you're in. You need to learn to master your uh, area of expertise. You know, so in, in the room, I guess we can go through like maybe three segments. So we got, uh, we said some people are in real estate. Anybody in like food and beverage? And then what's another one? Maybe like uh, services, anybody like photography, wedding planning, anything like that. So we kind of get an idea of the room. You talked about knowing your market space. Can I deduct meals in every marketplace? Is that something that bases on your state, on your Fed? How does that work? We all oh. think about meals and entertainment first, right? Right. Well, it, it, we we stay away from the word entertainment right now. <laughs> Under the uh, Trump Tax <laughs> Act, that is non-deductible. So entertainment <laughs> is a bad word. Um, uh, but if it's business related, then it would be deductible. Um, and so, so if we're concerned about meals being deemed entertainment, I would advise you to write on the receipt of what business you're doing with regard to that meal so it's easy for us to regurgitate that when and if we were ever called on the carpet to do it. So, so keeping track of what you're doing and how you're doing it is up to you. Number one, let's make sure we record it. Number two, if it could be entertainment related an issue, then, then let's keep um, notes real time. And even if it's just on the receipt, it's still that's still an accounting and that will regurgitate your memory as to what business was transacted at that particular meal, for example. Just fascinating. You always see, you always hear these stories, everybody like, oh no, it's a business write-off. Oh, I'll just write that off. I think that's just a common misconception that everything can be a write-off. Oh, it's business, I'll just write it off. But before we kind of move on, what kind of, that's trouble. When somebody's like, oh, I gotta hire you, and kind of the next question, so I'll let you answer it first, is like hiring professional help. If you think everything is a business write-off, you're, you're digging a hole that they're not gonna be able to get out of, and R Ruth said something amazing earlier. It was just like, it's almost like you did something, and you're like, hey, I know I need you because I did something, and that's why I need you. Not, hey, I'm thinking about something. This is how I want this to end. Can you help me get to that end result? I thought that was a really good, uh, just some clarity to that. So, so Michael, you know, we're talking about taxes here and, and these whole write-offs. So hiring professional help. When should a business owner or consider hiring an accountant or bringing on an attorney from the perspective of everything we're discussing here tonight? Okay. Um, this is a, another common um, mistake that you see a lot. Um, people don't go to their attorney to set up their initial um, entity. They do it themselves. And so when they do it themselves, when as soon as it says active on your secretary of state or your corporation commission, then they think they're finished. If you don't finish your corporate formalities, if you don't have a corporate book and you don't have an operating agreement or a buy-sell, I mean, a, a bylaws in your corporate book, you never finish setting up your company. You actually don't have a company for asset protection purposes at all. So you, you, you need to start out <laughs> with the right professionals to help you not make just basic mistakes that you, that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise know if you didn't have a background in this stuff. So we're going to just jump right over to Ruth as you're continually nodding and nodding and nodding. Are you nodding from personal experience or the fact that your business is booming because you're like, hey, keep doing what you're doing. Business is good. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of both. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, to, every entrepreneur needs an accountant. We cannot do our own taxes. We should not even try. So speaking from my own experience, I talked to the person I hired as my accountant who has been my accountant since 2011 um, before I opened my business. Um, for business purposes, um, for tax purposes, I decided I was going to wait till after the first of the year to file my LLC. Um, but I met with my accountant months before to be like, how do I do this? What do I do? What entity do I need? Um, and then I later learned, hire a bookkeeper to set up your QuickBooks if that's what your accountant tells you to use. Because even though you're all really smart, and even if you, even if you might buy QuickBooks for dummies, no, you're going to screw it up. And you're going to end up hiring a bookkeeper to fix what you screwed up. Speaking of uh, fixing what you screwed up, um, it's best to talk with a lawyer even before you open your entity so that they can talk with you about what are you thinking about doing, what's in your plan to date, um, what's your budget, and because if you're on a limited budget, they can tell you, this is what you can do yourself, this is what you really shouldn't do yourself. This is what's important to do now or, you know, do is, you know, kind of help you create like a checklist. Okay, do this, do this, do this. And then, you know, next year, you know, we'll do this next thing. Um, and so that way you are going to them 
preparing to succeed, not putting yourself in a situation of like, I signed this contract, should I have done that? <laughs> you know, there are certain bells I can't unring. So, yeah. So oh, what, yeah. And it's not as expensive as you think to hire a lawyer for mm. an hour to just have that initial consultation to help you lay out your foundation for your business. And, and Hua, you know, talking about um, considering bringing on an expert, you know, if budget's a concern, I think intellectual property, you're like, hey, you said something, you're like, I got the cure for cancer, and you're like, okay, whoa, 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 like, that's a very broad statement, but all, it's just, your experience is fascinating, like, you're in sciences, and now you're into legal, and then intellectual property, I think everyone here thinks they have a, a good idea, and you're like, okay, I'm going to start this business, but if someone here has that great idea, you're like, okay, do I tell anybody? How do I even figure out what the budget is because I have this idea? Talk about what that's like in your world, intellectual property, which to me sounds like the big gorilla, like, oh, it's quite intimidating to hire that lawyer. It probably seems like it's intimidating to hire an IP lawyer, but it's probably your best investment because unlike contract issues that maybe you can get out of, intellectual property deals with market monopoly. If you give up an opportunity, that's it. You don't have a chance of fixing it. So for example, with patents, if it's used in the market commercially, that is no longer available for a patent application. That is just a ban. You can't make it available to the public and then suddenly take it back. Same thing, um, you came up with an idea, you didn't register it, um, like you came up with the mark, trademark, you didn't register it, someone else did. It can, I mean, your attorney can maybe try and negotiate your ability to use it, but that's gonna cost money, and the answer is usually going to be no. And worst case scenario, the answer is sure, you can use it for this limited circumstance, but then you have to revisit it every single time, and it's just a lot of headaches. So with regard to developing an IP strategy, and all of you should be thinking about that, like Ruth said, talk to an IP attorney for an hour. And if you do enough homework, meaning you have your business plan and you kind of know what your five-year plan is going to be like, go in and tell the attorney, this is where I would like to go, tell me what I need to do. And they'll probably take half the time to understand your business and then the other half the time they'll probably be giving you a preliminary outline of what you should be planning, what you should be expecting. And then that's where you can go, all right, thank you for the plan, please give me a quote for how much this is going to cost in the next five years. And then you can budget that way. <laughs> so again, out loud, we're in intimidated is probably the, the wrong word, but legal is, is needed, but it's intimidating because again, th 12 years or three years, whatever it is, it's expensive. So, you know, Ruth, we were talking before about, you know, your family said, oh, Ruth is in uh, law school. I had this question, and it was your first year. I can't really go to you for law advice there. But as somebody that's, you, you said you started your firm right when you came out of college? Yeah, right out of law school. So, right out of law school. So, everyone in here is like, oh, I got this friend that just graduated. Is that a good idea? Like, it's cheaper, so I'm just going to go to my boy because he just got out of school. Or walk us through, like, I think in this room, if I humble it down a little bit, we're looking for the homie discount. Where do we start the introductory phase of like, budgets are a concern when you're a startup. So give me a little bit of advice, like you talked before, like just ask for one hour. What are some low entry points, whether there's resources or ways where it's, hey, I'm not looking for the number one law firm in the world from, a, you know, whatever. Walk me through what that looks like. There are so many ways I want to go with this question. So for well, homie hookup should be first. Am yes. I right here? Like okay. <laughs> I mean, first things first, hook yourself up. There is this, you may have heard of it, there is this thing called Google. It's a really good resource for giving from getting some you know basic information, especially if you can find a lawyer who does a blog. Uh, where they're just giving information away for free. I have a blog, I have a YouTube channel, and I tell people I, that's where I give it away for free. People will pay me to tell them the exact same things I have already put out on the internet for free. Um, so you know, avail yourself to that, so that way you can make the most of your hour with your attorney. Um, you want to get a lawyer who understands what you're doing. Just like you don't go to 
a gynecologist for a nose problem, you don't go to a personal injury attorney to help you set up your business. So if people are like, oh, can you help me with this thing? It's like, okay, the law is very vast. I work in these little slivers of it. So you wanna, you wanna work with somebody who understands your business, understands your needs. If you can find someone that does business and IP, awesome. If they do transactional and litigation work, even better. Yes, I happen to be one of those people. Let's go! Yeah, the homie hook is right here tonight. And unfortunately, and we have big firms and we have small firms, so don't be afraid to shop around and ask people for their rates. Um, because if you want the white, what my coworker calls the white shoe experience, and go to the big fancy law firm, they're great. That's fun to visit. Um, you're also going to pay for that experience versus if you go to a smaller firm, it may be somebody that your friends haven't heard of, but if, if it's the right fit for you, your business, they, under, they get you. You know, they get you as a person, they get your business, um, and they can help you, like, and they're cheaper because they don't pay for downtown Phoenix rent. Um, why not? So don't be afraid to shop it around and not just go with the, you know, first result on Google. Uh, and so, Michael, you know, your situation is unique. You're an accountant and a lawyer. So, again, it sounds like we got a combo. We got a double combo here. It's a number one and a number two combo. Um, Dr. Pepper always. So, um, <laughs> different combos. But, you know, budget's a concern. You're a boutique firm having both in the house, so does that help? What are low entry models for the financial side? Um, when, when you're starting out, let your professional people d don't come in with an, an agenda. I have people that will start, that, that they've got their own little to do list. You're better off to say where do you want to ask open-ended questions in the beginning, and and let the professional people that do this for a living steer you in the right direction. Don't be a do-it-yourself, or let, let let the folks help you, and they want to anyway. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? So, so like, the, if you get these super educated people, they do their own homework, and they come in with this litany of stuff that they need and think they want, and and that's maybe way too premature. And you you may not need a, a formal buy sell agreement if there's no partner. Do you see what I'm saying? And so so don't make your don't make it harder than it needs to be. And to piggyback on that, ask your lawyer what is the most cost effective way to do things. So for example, it's cheaper to hire me to draft your contract from scratch than to try to write it yourself and have me review it. No. A lot of people are like, oh, I'll do it. I'll write it up myself. It'll be faster. No, you mm. don't know what you're doing. You didn't go to law school. That's okay. Say, I need a contract that does X, Y, and Z. And I'll be like, there are like 17 things you have totally are, you've already forgotten to put in. I'm on it. Well, and you cannot do business without an engagement agreement. The engagement agreement provides the scope of work of whatever it is that you do. You cannot start business on a handshake deal. That causes confusion, and, and that makes for unhappy relationships, and you'll get yourself in trouble. Engagement agreement means contract. Right. <laughs> so general advice, we're actually talking to a lawyer. We have to get malpractice insurance for a reason. So if you tell us to do something, we will do it, even if we're going, that's a terrible idea, that's a terrible idea. Oh, yes. Some clients, if we have a good enough relationship, will flat out say, that's a terrible idea, I recommend no. <laughs> Other clients that you're a little <laughs> bit afraid of or you don't really care about, you're like, okay, sure, you told me to do so. So if you ever get an email from your lawyer that says, you said this and that's what we're going to do, you might want to do a gut check and go, hey, wait a minute, should I actually be doing this? <laughs> that might be the most valuable advice of the night, so now you know what the voice sounds like coming in reverse, like, oh, that email came. Like, don't you guys send me that email when we're done here. That's what on this is, we're on the path now. So we're going to wrap up. We're going to start getting to some Q&A. We want to apologize to everybody online for some technical difficulties. We're going to go online, offline for just a second to fix that. Um, in, in the room, what we're going to do is we're going to um, ask as many questions as we can. We're going to go in person here, take some from virtually. Before we get to that, that Q&A part real quick, um, one thing, one leave behind. So far, I feel like this has just been incredible. Um, but one leave behind before we go to questions. We'll start while we'll work our way down. I think it's as an entrepreneur, you on one hand, you kind of have to defer to the professionals. But on the other hand, you really have to know what you're doing, know yourself, know your business. And then that's how you can actually find a professional team that works best for you and gets you and your business. So I would really say is be prepared, but not overconfident. 
Um, I guess the first thing I would do is if you've got a new startup business, think through what you're doing and how you're doing it. Let's make sure that our initial business model is designed to be profitable, right? I can't tell you, but we look at new businesses from time to time, and, and I can see on the face of it that it will not make money, <laughs> and you can't, you can't make it up on volume, right? If it, so if it's a losing situation, you need to change your business model is the very first thing, is to make, make sure that we got a profitable enterprise. And I would say it is cheaper and easier to prevent legal problems than it is to fix them. Mm. All right, so now we actually have something really special. We actually have one of our speakers from last week here tonight as well. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome our last week's speaker, Michael Spangenberg, up to the stage, please. <laughs> he, he pays the bills, so we're going to let him ask the first question. Yeah, thank you so much. We pay the bills. Um, <laughs> No, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm just kind of pulling an audible, but as I'm listening to you three, I didn't get the chance to meet you two. Super grateful for all three of you to be here. Um, CEO, co-founder of State 48. And I think it's so, I was just like grinning and smiling and laughing and sitting next to our first attorney, Talia. Sh shout out to Talia. Um, it is so crucial and important to invest into legal because we did everything the wrong way at the beginning the first three or four years, so like <laughs> hearing, hey, you should have had an operating agreement. What the heck is that? Hey, you should, like the one thing we did right was secure a trademark. We didn't do anything after. We didn't do anything until we secured our trademark. We did it through LegalZoom, um, and then we started working with Talia and just gave all this incredible advice. advice. Um, but just like, again, the buy-sell agreement, uh, we didn't have an official accountant for like several years. There's literally everything we did the wrong way um, and that's where I think the beauty of business and entrepreneurship is like sometimes you have to go through those things to learn what not to do but really really take this advice very um, very <laughs> take this very very to the like, take this to the heart because it is so important and you know we were the first company in er ever in Arizona to start State 48 um, there's 70 plus organizations now with State 48 branding in it you know we have legal issues all the time we've spent a lot of money um, protecting our rights, so it is so important, so crucial to protect your your assets and all the hard work you're about to put into it, or the years, and it's never too late. But I'll just tell you from experience, and that's why I just quickly wanted to add: we did everything the wrong way at the beginning, besides you know trademarking our 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 logo and our word mark. But um, take this information very uh, true to the heart and know that it's so important. That's all. But thank you guys for being here. Still made it. <laughs> Still made it. All right, we're going to pass the mic around. We're going to go to somebody in person here that uh, has a question on the floor. If you guys want to raise your hands, uh, we'll go right here with Joey first. And then we'll go ahead and go online from there. Go ahead. All right, so I don't know about anybody else, but all this law stuff makes my anxiety just go crazy. Um, you kind of brought it up, but what's the first step? All right, so, you know, we've had things. H how comfortable should we feel with our lawyer if we don't feel comfortable how do we go around building that relationship of trust, I think is a, is a big question for me. So I, I wish lawyers had better bios so that you, so it was easier for you to like preview them to be like, is this the right person for me? So I would start there. Um, and if you get in and you're like, this is a mismatch, you just, you know, Enjoy your hour, thank them for their time, and move on. Um, what I would, if as a new entrepreneur, I recommend you talk to other entrepreneurs and say, hey, who have you worked with? Who do you recommend? Who's good? Um, you know, we, that's, that's what we do when we need a, a dentist, a, a website designer. The, the same is true for hiring a lawyer, hiring an accountant. Hey, who's good? Who who gets people like us? Reach out to people who are, who were you, who maybe have been in the business for two or three years, who can say, all right, I like this person, this person rubbed me the wrong way because of X, Y, and Z. That's my two cents. Anything you wanna add? It is absolutely okay to break up with your lawyer, so don't feel like you have to force it. <laughs> all right, so we got a question coming from the virtual, anybody on the panel can, can answer this. So for a single owner LLC, 
Does it make sense to have a single owner operating agreement in place? I was advised to do so recently and wanted to understand whether it's a sensible step to take. Thank you. Okay, so, so when you set up your entity um, and, and it's registered at the state level, the next step is to finish your corporate formalities, which means if you have an LLC, you have to have a corporate book. So the first thing I ask the client is, where's your corporate book? And if they shrug their shoulders and say, what are you talking about? We know that they're not finished. And, and until your corporate book is executed in the form of an LLC, it, you need an, an operating agreement. If you're an incorporated business, you need bylaws. They basically work very similarly, but until your corporate book is developed and signed and, and put together, you're not finished with your corporate setup, right? And so if you don't finish your corporate setup, if there's a legal issue, then you don't have asset protection. There's, a, there's something called piercing the corporate veil, and the first thing they're gonna look at is it, are your corporate formalities in order? And so the, one of the first things we do is make sure that you've got your I's dotted and your T's crossed. <laughs> and so the answer is yes, you have to have that. Awesome, we got another question here in person. Um, I have a client who does manufacturing overseas where trademarks are not so strong. Their fear is that if they uh, increase their production that their particular design item will get swapped around. Is there any protection for that in, in Europe or the States uh, if another company decides to steal their, their design and start making it? I will take that. So the nice thing is IP is one of the lovely areas of law that doesn't differ too, too much internationally because there are a lot of international agreements. So there's something called the Madrid Protocol, which gives you a six month grace period in a way. So you can file in the US, and if you file for trademark registration anywhere else in six months, you have the same priority expected use um, as what you have submitted in the US. So if they're doing manufacturing, you might have to register in China if you need to make sure that that trademark is protected in China. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's laws. Laws, unfortunately, are limited to geographical areas. So yes, actually, if you're thinking of really growing your business, budget an international IP portfolio fee, and I will be honest, they can get expensive because of translations. Mm. But the Madrid Protocol is probably the cheapest way for you to gain an international trademark portfolio because they, unlike patents, actually do an evaluation in the beginning before then it's forwarded to all the national jurisdictions. Um, but so yes, it is possible to do trademark protection and actually keep it continuing in a chain. And I would recommend making that plan early. So if you know that you're going to be going overseas, tell your IP lawyer that, and then they will come up with an international plan for you. Mm. Well, thank you. So I'm uh, very grateful that um, just, and to this is, yeah. just to piggyback on that. Does it happen where like I've heard of a, a factory like the day you know the day and swing shift? Are, are manufacturing for their US customer and then the night shift that they don't claim to have is, is making knockoffs, totally happens. But I, speaking for myself, I'm not gonna delay building my business on the chance that I might have to deal with infringement at the same time. Um, I would talk to my lawyer about how do I prevent that. So perfect transition to the next question. Uh, I want to thank Mike for, for sharing that story about State 48. Uh, I'd probably personally tell that story aloud maybe, maybe more than I should, but I think it's just something so fascinating about being the first entity that was State 48, and now you have 70 plus in our state. So uh, uh, one of our online, yeah, so far, uh, one of our online uh, guests has said, what would you do? How do you protect a business name like State 48? My business name has gained some interest, and I'm worried it'll turn into State 48 Construction, State 48 Plumbing. So I guess it's a good example. From State 48, we came in saying, hey, we're going to be an apparel brand. And then all of a sudden, it evolved. And I guess Mike and Nick, when you first started, they had no idea it could become 70 different entities. So what would you have advised Mike and Nick when they first started? So then maybe we can answer that question for anyone else that's trying to do the same thing. That's like, oh, wow, I don't want a plumbing and an air conditioning company being construed with my apparel brand. I'm going to share the bad answer that nobody really wants to hear. 
Trademarks are limited to your goods and service. So if you're not doing business in other fields, your apparel, you don't get to keep someone in plumbing from doing State 48 plumbing. It doesn't work like that. It has to be tied to a good or service that you offer. Now, the good news, or that you're planning on expanding to, and that's the good news. There is a way of filing a trademark application that's called an intent to use. So if you know that you're going to be branching in into an area, but you don't actually have any goods or services being offered in commerce towards that area, you can file what's called an intent to use application. Mm -hmm. And within the right appropriate time, you need to adequately say that, oh, we're finally using this mark. Um, but extensions are allowed up to like, what, three years? Three years. So that's part of having your business plan and then setting your little place markers of like, this is my field as early as you can so that you can try to keep people out but you can't keep everyone out. And that's just because you can't do business and everything. And, and along those lines, who cares if somebody wants, if you have an apparel company and somebody else has a plumbing company, if the average consumer isn't gonna be con confused, we're back to Delta Dental and Delta Airlines. It's not, a, it's a non-issue. So real quick, we're gonna go back virtual real quick because this is a good question for, for Michael here. Um, what are some good tax filing resources for filing quarterly state taxes and federal taxes as an LLC with one owner? Is it true that you don't need to file your taxes for your business if you have not broke or made a profit yet? Well, as soon as you set your entity up your, and you get an EIN number, the federal and state uh, authorities are going to be looking for your tax returns. So you're bet you need to file tax returns once you set your entity up. Now, with regard to quarterly filing, um, if you're in a business that requires you to have a payroll check, you may want to look at a payroll service to file those forms for you. If you make a mistake with regard to payroll withholding, it gets very expensive very quickly. If you're in a single member LLC, they're going to calculate self-employment tax on your actual tax return. And if you're a partnership, the same thing. You don't have to have a W-2 paycheck in those entities. I would get with my tax professionals and determine if that's the best route for me. With an S corporation, that you're not subject to self-employment tax on all of its earnings, but you have to have a W-2. So that's a little more complicated than just a cookie cutter answer. But, but long story short is, um, you need to get with your tax people to help you do those things because if you make a mistake, especially with regard to payroll withholding, it gets very expensive very quickly. And, and, they, and they're very hesitant to let you evade it at all. To piggyback with that, I have an LLC. What I do when my accountant does my taxes, he also gives me the forms I need to do my quarterlies. So all I have to do on the designated day is take the form, you know, I put in a number, cut a check. Yes, I still do that because I'm old school and put it in the mail. So it's, it can be considered like part of the package that your accountant does for you. And I think it should be. So we're going to go to Tim has got one in, but at both sides of the room, we want to kind of tap. If you had a question, you want to raise your hand real quick just so we can acknowledge who's in the room with questions. Got two in the back, one on the right, one on the left. Okay, go ahead, Tim. Next one. So cost is a concern for most new entrepreneurs, and there may be a desire or a motivation to cut costs. Can you touch on the use of online legal services, such as, this is not a knock on them, but such as, for example, LegalZoom. Should an entrepreneur use those services, and, and um, what would you say about that? We have attorney client privilege in this room. Is that where we no. should start here? Okay. No. For some things, legal Zoom can be fine. I have heard other lawyers say that they love legal Zoom because they get plenty of business fixing the mistakes made by legal Zoom. So this goes back to my original recommendation of talk to your attorney and ask them. I'm on a budget, what can I do for myself? Um, 
you know, what do you, you know, can I outsource to this third party program um, and get their take on it before you just decide to wing it on your own? Um, because I bet you're all like really smart about running your business. Um, but just like I don't do my own taxes, I'm not going to DIY them. I don't want you to DIY your legal. So I'll give you an, exa an, an example that we've run into over the years. If you go on LegalZoom because you know that you need a will or an estate plan and you have LegalZoom prepare this document for you, if you have your children witness your will, it's voided. <laughs> So if you so you don't you want to be careful those they you can get forms but if you don't know what you're doing number one you could draft it wrong and number two if you think you've executed something and you've done it incorrectly you may find out at a period that it's too late to correct it especially in a will situation if you don't know until you are deceased then then you are in test state and you thought you had a will that can be a big big problem. From an IP perspective, I say LegalZoom is good for when checking a box is okay. It doesn't give you an IP strategy. So you're putting money into something that may or may not be helpful. Hopefully it's helpful, hopefully it's not useless. So sure, you can ask LegalZoom to help you file a trademark when you know that it's going to work, it's going to be registered and everything is gonna go smoothly and it might actually be the cheapest way. But if you actually want to come up with a strategy to protect your brand and marketing plans, LegalZoom won't do that. Hmm. And I think we had a question on the resource side of the room. Was it over on that side, another question? Yes, go ahead. So I guess this is a two-part question. Um, if you search for a trademark and you find that it's dead at some point, are you able to, or how would you go about registering that? And then how closely do the characters have to be for example, like we will versus wheel type of thing. Okay, so if you find that a mark is listed as dead, you can still, um, it, from a USPTO examination perspective, if it's a dead mark and it's in your same industry, you can still use it. Yes, yes, assuming it hasn't gone generic. Um, so go going generic is kind of like, is Kleenex generic now? Well, they try. Uh, zipper, zipper is the one that has gone generic. <laughs> mm. And not every trademark is trademarkable. So what I would do if something's listed as dead, I would go looking at the documents and they're all public and to see why is it dead. Um, and so if it's a situation where it's just like they didn't renew it, the company went out of business, then yes, you could try to register it and take over that name. I'm gonna let Hua take over. Right, so, so find out why it's dead, essentially. If it had a registration number and then you see that it's dead, then it's probably not the bad news that it's not registrable. It just means that they probably decided to not pay fees or the business gone and the mark is no longer used in commerce. Uh, in terms of likeness, wheel versus we will. It's kind of like a gambling situation. It depends on what your trademark examiner decides. If you're asking that question, that's a red flag for no. You're, it sounds like you're trying to ride the coattails of a competitor um, and no. Um, so it, 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 no, it comes down to whichever examiner reviews your application and they're humans and what they say if it's too similar or not. So when in doubt, no. Um, I love trade, I love when companies have trademarks that are words that didn't exist before. Kodak, Xerox, Verizon, were not words, still aren't real words, they're brands. Um, much easier to get through the process with a lot less risk, I should say. So let's throw it back to, to Michael here. Let, can we do a little rapid fire? Um, rapid fire question, I'm a sole proprietor. What am I thinking, am I still an LLC if I'm a sole proprietor? Um, that can be a little confusing. If you're a single member LLC, you're called a, um, a, a disregarded entity, 
and you file a tax return as a sole proprietor on your Schedule C, typically if it's an operating business. It could also be on a Schedule E if it was residential real estate. So, so long story short, you still have asset protection if you have a, an LLC that has a corporate book that is appropriately filled out, your asset protection value of that entity, which is, is what you start out with. When you get an entity, you wanna protect your home, right? So you start out with an asset protection analysis um, um, and the tax piece follows whatever choice you make with regard to entity structure, but all of that can be fixed and changed regardless of what type of entity you choose. That's so thing. second part, my wife and I, were gonna go do this business together, we're an LLC. Why would we go into being a C corp or an S corp, and, and what, what? How do we do that, and why? Okay, okay. So a, a tax professional can can utilize um, the check the box regulations, and so no matter what type of entity you are, you can elect to be taxed in any manner that you so desire. But whatever the choice that you make is, you're subject to that choice for five years. So if you're an LLC and you're a single member LLC, it will automatically default to a disregarded entity and you'll file as a sole proprietor. If you are a multi multiple partner LLC, it will default to the partnership rules. If you're an incorporated business, it will default to a C corporation. And so of all of those companies, you can elect to be taxed as an S corporation, a C corporation, a partnership, or if you are a single member LLC, you can be a sole proprietorship. There are different rules for every single one of those choices. And so as you develop as an entrepreneur, you want to revisit these issues because you're gonna wanna take advantage of the pros and cons of each of those sets of rules and you need somebody to help you do that. Mm. So real quick before we go on, uh, Ruth, question for you back to what we were just discussing. Um, you know, you're with your friend your friend comes up with this idea for a business, and you're like, oh, we're going to be business partners. I'll pay for the meal, but we're going to do this business together. That person goes on and starts the business, but I was there and bought the meal. What rights do I have to then say, hey, we were business partners? A lot of what we discussed here today was, oh, I thought I was going to have a partner, but then there was no contract in place. And one of the questions is about contracts, but everyone in this room is probably thinking, like, I got a friend I want to start a business, a loved one I want to start a business with. Talk about, like, the... I guess the best way to say is the liability or, oh, shoot, you're, I know you bought the meal, but you're on your own. <laughs> yeah, it's really easy to create a situation where people have by a verbal partnership. And as soon as possible, you want to legally formalize that with an entity, with an operating agreement. So you don't get into that situation where one person runs with the idea and you're going, yeah, but wait, we had an agreement, we had lunch. And it's like, do you really want to have a lawsuit about, over, you know, about something that happened over lunch? Yeah. Like, per these are preventable issues. Mm. So yeah, I, I would be careful about talking about business so you don't create the impression that you've agreed to be in a partnership with somebody and you just like walk away, you know, from it with where one of you thinking, yeah, we're doing this. And one person was like, we had ideas. It's like, no, this is one of those times when words matter. Mm. So yeah. don't do that. Words and actions. Uh, Tim, you had a question. Yeah, just for Michael, if you could. <coughs> how, how often as a business owner could you potentially amend a tax return? Why would you do that? I, I assume a lot of people in this room after this are gonna have Rocky syndrome, we hope, and it continues, uh, and go have their tax professional review a tax return. H how frequently and why would you do that? Uh, okay, if you, miss, if you miss a deduction, or even worse, if you miss a revenue item, then you can amend your tax return in order to fix it. Now, for, for people that regularly don't do what they're supposed to do, you can amend and back indefinitely. If the government owes you money, you can only amend back three years and get a refund. If it's four years, then you've just lost whatever you are entitled to. And so you need to pay attention to what you're doing. On, on the, for the guys, it, so I, 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 for, I guess I forgot to tell you this, guys. I'm also a member of the United States Tax Court, so I can litigate in tax court. In my defense practice, we do that. So people that break the rules regularly, when, we deter, when, when they come to the... We don't want to be a, a scoundrel anymore because we're afraid of the risk again, and, and facing the federal government. You're supposed to amend those tax returns, especially if you are committing fraud by not paying, by not claiming your income. Um, and so the answer is you can go back indefinitely. You can only get a refund back for three years. One other quick point that you need to know. 
if you don't file a tax return, then the statute of limitations for collections never was told. So, so if you put your head in the sand and don't file for five years, there's a 10-year collection statute of limitation on tax liability. So, what, so if they don't collect it in 10 years, it goes away, and it comes off of your um, credit report and all of those items. If you never filed the return, you never started the collection statute running, and it's open-ended until you file, and then 10 years from that. So don't play, don't play games with this stuff. Mm. So we got time for about two more questions. I know Tim's got one there. We'll get this last one right there in the middle. Yeah. How's it going? This may be an advanced question, but I was wondering if you <laughs> have come across any sort of like blockchain, smart contracts, or like Web3 technology um, in your... <laughs> I, I have not done that. I have not seen any of those. I have um, studied this crypto stuff to the best of my knowledge. I am no expert on it whatsoever, but I'm aware that, that things look like they're going in that direction. And that, that's one of the claims to fame of the whole thing. I don't understand it. In fact, I was telling my clients early on that I don't understand Bitcoin. I would stay away from it until we understand it better. And that was a mistake. I can have people that, that are not happy with that. <laughs> anyway, do you want to call? To the moon. To the moon. I follow the, like, the NFT space a little bit. And when it comes to smart contracts, Read the smart contract before you make a purchase so that you understand what you can and can't do with what you just bought. Or uh, we got two questions here back to back and then we'll kind of start wrapping up. We'll get to the networking time, but yeah, go ahead. Hi, mine is uh, very simple. It's probably just a yes or no. Um, are legal fees deductible? Considering how many we're probably gonna have. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> there, there will be deductible. And, and well, if it's business related, if, you, if you're getting a divorce, then that is a non-business transaction. <laughs> and and that, in that situation, it wouldn't be deductible. <laughs> Hi, my name's Jeremy. Uh, my question is, is if I sell an item and have a receipt or, or proof of, of uh, selling the item, does that protect me from somebody else getting a trademark? on the same brand name? I think what you're asking about is that if you have a, what's called like a token sale, like you sold one, is that enough to, to be in commerce? Every legal question, answer starts with, it depends. If it is like you opened your Etsy store or your website and you had your, for, and you don't even have to actually make a sale. You just have to be available for sale. So for my clients who don't want to file the intent to use trademark application, I tell them, tell me when that website goes live because I can file your trademark application the same day as being in commerce. What we've seen in some situations is somebody who isn't really ready to offer their product to the public will do like a one-off sale to a friend or an employee and be like, that was our, that's when we're in commerce. It's like, no, it has to be a, was it a bona fide offer of sale to the public. Hi, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, so I'm an engineer and I understand uh, blockchain and web development like on an engineering level, but I'm coming to the point where I'm needing to either file a patent for some sort of IP, or I need to, you know, uh, file my taxes for the, the past year, and there are a lot of tokens that are, you know, have gone back and forth and have been exchanged, and there's no trade wash rule in the crypto space, and so I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to leverage my trades right now so that I can have the, the, the minimize my tax liability and, and, and maximize my opportunity going forward. So I guess what I want to know is does trading into a stable coin count as a taxable event, and what other sort of opportunities are there out there for me to, and, and like, who should I even ask about this, first of all, I guess? Okay, th this, is, this area is confusing um, to people. So if you, if you sell a stock, if you own GE stock and you sell it, it's a taxable event. And so your gain will be your basis, whatever you paid for it, um, and, and it'll be either gain or loss. So whatever you bought it for, when you sold it, it'll either be more or less than what you bought it for, right? And it's a taxable event. 
if you if you sell GE because it's at a loss and you purchase it again within 30 days, the wash sale rules avoid you from being able to take that loss. The wash sale rules do not apply to cryptocurrency. So people in a down market are selling their cryptocurrency, taking the losses, and then immediately buying it back. And, and that is happening, and, and apparently that's okay. That won't last long. I, I can tell you that, that they will apply the wash rules because it, it is an investment just like a, a stock, even though it's not defined as a stock. It is a, it is a capital asset. And so if you want to take advantage of the wash sale rules, the rules are that you can do that. I don't think that'll hold muster for long. Well, I can say this is uh, quite a bit an incredible experience. Am I right? Has this been good for everybody? You know, thank you guys again for taking the time out of your schedules. Most importantly, shout out to my girl Lucy over here. Lucy, look, she's been a good, look, she's just hanging. She's the best. Oh, it's my girl. You know, again, this just goes to show the community here, and, and we're very grateful for these members taking time out of their schedules um, to, to provide this, and I hope you guys got something from this. Um, so we got some really cool leave behinds that, that we're going to have here. So, you know, Tax Law Associates, uh, Michael and his colleague Bruce over here, um, they're going to offer a free 30-minute finance consultation to everyone that came here today for free. Um, pretty special there. So you're going to want to make sure you guys connect afterwards. Um, Hua's firm, uh, Booth Udall, is offering a 30-minute consultation to audience members to discuss specific IP needs. And at the very, 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 very least, I think our members have some time here to kind of hang out afterwards and kind of negotiate your ability to work with them after spending time with us here tonight. And uh, most importantly, don't forget, we're, we're giving away up $25,000 here. They're going to be in different grants of 1000 and 5000 And um, all this is made possible because of this community. Um, if you work for a company, I see we had a Healy River shirt over there. It was at our poker tournament. Um, that was an incredible fundraiser that we did in conjunction with some great partners. Um, every shirt that if you work for a company or you have a friend that works for a company, you're doing a State 48 collab, a dollar from every shirt comes back to this foundation to let us do things like this. So we're very grateful to this community. We're grateful to each and every one of you for investing in yourselves to, to grow small business in this community and continue to change uh, the way this community looks. So with that, on the way out, don't forget we got our resource center over here to the left. We got our State 48 booth out there. Walter Studios, again, just incredible partners offering up this space. And don't forget the survey goes out tonight. Tomorrow, we got two more sessions next week and the week after. We want to see each and every one of you guys here. Um, OGs, man. OGs. We sent a shout out saying, hey, we're looking for a title sponsor, and OGs stepped up. Without them, um, we can't continue to invest more into entrepreneurs like each and every one of you. So, OGs, Walter Studios. Next week, we got GCU. Just an incredible partnership. So, thank you guys all again. Enjoy your night, and we'll see you guys again next week.